When this class doesn't have one, I said I don't have one. Like, none of my other plans give up. Well, it's not going to make you think it's an hour to say positive. Also, it's something the part between the moment. Literally, it's not that we don't have to be at the moment. Oh, that was the first to be last. What happened? Yeah. How? It was supposed to be like one half hour. Yeah, Oh my god, you're gonna die. Why? Let me Stop. Turn around. Like I can finish it, but it's something. I stab you. I stab you. Hi guys. Page uh, page four. Oh, second packet or first packet? This is the uh, smaller, the uh, second packet, sorry. Yeah, we're, uh, we're kind of jumping back and forth between the two packets. This is the uh, the new one with second theorem. We ended uh, talking about second theorem of calculus. And uh, the big picture here is that we're doing two opposing operations on the same function. When we do that, we're largely going to leave this function unchanged, uh, but there is a little bit of leftover from both processes. Uh, so the, the leftover is that the upper bound is going to get inserted into the function, and then the derivative is going to have an impact on the upper bound. So it's f of p of x times p prime. Uh, it's a lot more efficient than having to do a full integral process, evaluate the bounds, and then turn around and do the derivative. We want to take advantage of of uh, the shortcut, especially if we know that the the calculus operations are going to cancel each other out. Okay, so let's do some examples and uh, see if we can apply these theorem. So uh, I want to find the derivative of a depth integral from negative three to x of root t squared plus four. I know I could do a second theorem because I have two operations on the same expression. So let's just follow what the rule says. F of P of X, what would that look like for this expression? Mm -hmm. So square root of X squared plus four times one. Now we normally can't just plug the upper bound into the expression, right? If it's just a definite, if it's just definite integral, we got to do the full calculus procedure before we can plug in the upper, upper and lower bound. But the only way we're doing, reason we're not going to do this is because we know the derivative is going to take us back to the starting function. So normally we can't just plug the upper bound into the expression if there's an integral notation. And this is the only exception here. Notice uh, the negative three has no impact because. Um, when that negative three eventually gets plugged into the antiderivative, it's going to turn into a constant, and the constant will get turned into a zero. So any constant in the lower bound will, will get wiped out. Okay. Part B, the only difference is the lower lower bound here is, oh, sorry, um, yeah, uh, lower bound is different, and the, sorry, the expression is a little bit different as well. Okay, try part B, and then we'll compare our answers. B and C are virtually the same. Any questions there? Upper bound gets inserted in, into the expression, multiplied by the upper bound's derivative. Is part C going to have uh, a different same, right? The only thing that's different are, are the lower bounds, but we know the lower bound is just going to go away to a zero ultimately.
Okay, what do you notice about part D that's a little different? Hmm? From a variable to a constant, what can we do so that it can fit this form a little better? Take a flip the signs and pull a negative in front. Yeah. Okay. All right, any questions? Yes. Yeah, when you pull a negative on where does it go? Does it go outside the integral or does it come into the? Uh, doesn't. Yeah, uh, you can put it anywhere, inside or outside. Uh, what's different about part E? Uh, they're, they're both. They're variable. both variable, which means that they're both going to have uh, impact on the problem. And so here's the adapted uh, formula for upper and lower bounds being both variables. So we basically do the same process for both. Uh, start with the upper bound, f of p of x times p prime, and then minus, do the same thing with the lower bound, f of q of x times q prime. So we do the same thing with the upper and lower bound. We just start with the upper bound, end with the lower bound, and then put a minus in between. Try that, see if you can uh, follow this rule for part E. Upper bound into the expression, we get 2x squared plus 3 times the upper bound's derivative, 2x, minus, repeat the same process with the lower bound, 2x plus 3 times the lower bound's derivative times 1. I'm just cleaning all that up down to a trinomial there. Any questions? Okay, all right, let's try one last example, uh, and then we can move on to some something else. Uh, try example two. I know I say two at the bottom there. Another example, bottom of the page. I swap the bounds, pull a negative out in front. Then I um, applied process upper bound into the expressions variable. 
multiply that by the upper bounds derivative. All right, any questions? Okay, next up, page five. Are we okay? All right, average value theorem. Um, okay. If a function is able to be integrated on the closed interval, then the average value on the interval is. Um, so basically, it's saying, uh, let's say we had a curve along an interval. And we're basically asking for what is the average height if we were to average out all the different heights along this curve? That's what we're doing. We're trying to find that average value. Okay. Um, no, uh, so basically, we're also trying to do this as well, that the average value is going to be, we know that this is going to produce some area value, right? And we can also think of it this way, where there must exist a rectangle of a certain height that also shares the same area as the area that we see in the shaded region. Okay. Uh, okay, let me ask you this. What is the area of a rectangle? Yeah, base times height, width times height, okay. Uh, Now, what if I asked you to solve for height? Hmm? So height will be equal to what? Area divided by width. OK, so area divided by the width equals the height. So if you understand this formula, then that's basically what this is doing. This is basically, it looks complicated, but it's really just area divided by the width. Um, so f of c represents the height. Let me write it out this way here. f of c is equal to the, the area component is the integral. So it's the integral from a to b of f of x dx. That's going to be the area under this region divided by the width. So the width is just b minus a. But rather than uh, writing it this way, typically it's presented as 1 over b minus a. So it just pulls the coefficient, the, the denominator as a coefficient out in front. But it's still the same thing, right? It's area divided by the width equals the height. So we're finding the area, dividing by the width, and figuring out what is the average height amongst all, amongst all the heights that we accumulated. So example one, find the average value. In other words, find the average height amongst all the heights on the function between two and five. So we're just going to follow the formula here. My average height is just one over the width, one over b minus a, times the integral from a to b of x squared plus one bx. So we just basically have to work through this problem here. That one over five minus two, that's just the coefficient. We know that we never want to uh, involve the bounds first, right? This is just simply a power rule. We apply power rule, we plug in the upper and lower bound, and then we can clean up um, this down to a number. And that number will, will be the average height amongst the heights on this curve.
Right. You have multiple ways that you can do this. If you want to distribute the one third through, then do power rule and then upper lower bound, you can. Or you can do power rule for this expression, upper lower bound, and then multiply through with one third. Um, it's all okay. I'm going to take care of the, uh, the power rule portion first, then the upper and lower bound, clean that up, and then multiply by one third. You can use your calculator if you like, but. This is the result of my area. I don't want to forget about my width component, so either I multiply one third through at the beginning or I got involved that one third at the end. So the average height is 14. So just kind of give you a visual as to uh, what we've achieved here. So x squared plus one looks like this. Between two and five, We're averaging out all the heights between here, and we found out that the average height is 14, which is probably somewhere around here. Okay. So this process allows us to find that average height of 14. And now part B, it says find the C value. So basically saying, OK, we know the average height is 14, but where does the graph actually hit that average height? There's no way that this can be the average height without the graph actually reaching that average height somewhere in between. So it's a little bit like mean valley theorem kind of undoing that process. So um, how can I find the location of that height? Mm -hmm. So 14 will go in for what? Five. Is 14 the x or the y value? One. Yeah, so 14 will go in for the Y. Yep, and we're working backwards to solve for X. Now, when we solve for X, where does X have to live? Yeah, between two and five. Good. We get plus or minus root 13. Negative root 13 is clearly outside the interval. So we're only going to keep what's between. So Ruben. All right, does that process make sense? All right, can we try 47 uh, and repeat that process to see if uh, uh, if all the steps make sense as you try it? So bottom of the page. You can use your calculator if it um, if it helps you.
right? Set up your formula first. Replace all your A's and B's with negative 2 and 2. Make sure that the bounds never gets inserted into the integrand, right? we got to take the time to do power rule before the bounds play a role in our problem. So we take care of 4 minus x squared first, go through power rule, 4x minus x cubed over 3, then evaluate the bounds. Upper bound gets inserted first, minus, then lower bound. Clean all that up. Don't forget about that 1 fourth that's sitting in front as a coefficient. Once you multiply that 1 fourth through, then you have your average height, you have your average value. So if that's the average height, the graph has to reach that average height somewhere along that path. So we go back and find the x value location for that y value on the graph. So plug a thirds into the function, make sure that a thirds replaces your y variable, and then you solve for x. In this case, the plus or minus 2 over root 3 are both inside the interval, so we keep both our c values. So this is basically the reverse process of mean value theorem for, um, but this is for integrals. The, uh, there is a, a slight distinction though. For derivatives, mean value theorem, the C value has to live between the interval. But for average value theorem, it's okay to have the C value sitting at the endpoint. I know that doesn't happen for this problem, just wanna point that distinction out. Okay, next page. Okay. You guys feel okay with mean value, uh, with average value theorem? Uh, it's just a little messy because you got to go through a whole power rule. You got to keep track of all those numbers. But um, you no, know, the only thing different between that and depth integral is you got to worry about that one over b minus a in front, which is the only thing that's different here is. We have to multiply uh, additional coefficient from that width. But everything else is just power rule, evaluating definite rules. OK, so uh, these are just some problems I picked uh, from uh, practice AP exams. And these all kind of highlight second theorem uh, in many ways here. So let's try some of these problems. Number one, this problem looks intimidating because like, wow, I got to do this whole integral procedure and derivative, but notice the second theorem here, right? We're, un we're doing opposite operations on the same expression. So we can simply rely on second theorem here and jump to the end, do our shortcut here. So f of p of x times p prime, right? So what does that look like? Natural log of x times one. Yep. Yeah. Once you get used to second theorem, then it's nice because it's like, oh, I can skip all this calculus procedure, just jump to the end, just have to do a little bit of derivative. But really, it's uh, it's it's um, very fast. Okay, so here's uh, number two. G of x is the integral. But I want to find the derivative of this integral. So that's nice. I can apply second theorem here. So I want to just indicate what I want to do. I want to find the derivative of this mess.
you see two opposite operations applied on the same expression, we can do second theorem. Okay, so try second theorem, f of p of x times p prime, see what you get. Okay, I see some students doing this even without the derivative notation in front. So we can't do this unless we see derivative and integral on the same expression, right? Um, if we just see integral notation, then uh, we have to just do the full procedure. Okay, we haven't learned yet how to do the integral of this. Uh, this requires something that we're going to talk about next week called u substitution, which is like the un opposite procedure of chain rule. But right now we can do this because um, uh, we don't have to do the full integral procedure to get to the answer because we know that these two operations cancel each other out. Careful that uh, pi x gets inserted into the t, so both the pi and the x get squared. Questions with try number three. You may need to do some adjustment before you can apply a second theorem. If you're working ahead of me, you can check your answers with the key. I have the key attached in your packet. Any questions, bottom of page six? Top of page seven. Now, this is an application of first theorem. Okay, so top of page six, uh, top of page seven, number four, is an application of first theorem of calculus. We know that if we take a function and make it go through the integral process, our function is going to change. So what's ultimately going to happen with f double prime? I take the antiderivative, it'll become what? A prime, yep. And then once we have our antiderivative, we plug in our upper and lower bound. Right? So we're just applying this um, theorem here. We know that the integral from A to B of f of x dx, it's just uppercase f of B minus uppercase f. Right? So if we take that and adapt it for this problem here, we can say the integral from 5 to 10 of f double prime, which is equal to what? F prime of B. Mm -hmm. What's our B value? Oh, 10, yep. Yeah. Minus F prime of 5, okay. So a lot of different ways that first theorem can be applied. It can be applied from 
f double prime to f prime. It could be applied from f prime to f of x, from velocity to position, from acceleration to, to velocity, right? Uh, capital F means antiderivative, right? Okay, let's see here. All right, number five. Uh, the graph of F is given. G is the antiderivative of F. So let's write out what that looks like. G is the antiderivative of F. So that means the relation between G and F are staggered, right? Um, that G and F are not at the same level. If I find the derivative of both sides, I think we can kind of see the, the more clear relationship that so G becomes G prime. If I take the derivative of this, what is that going to turn into? Just that, yeah, derivative of integral, which is cancel each other out, right? So this right now, this is sitting at a level above F. If we take the derivative, it's going to wipe out the integral and now it's going to bring me back down to F. So the F graph is given. And the relationship is that this is the G prime. This is my G prime graph. So if I want to connect G prime and G, this is what I can do. I can say, I, I know my two X values are zero and three. So we can say this, right? The integral from zero to three of G prime must be equal to what? Yeah, G of three minus g of zero, and that's nice because now we have everything in front of us to use. We have g of three, which is six. We're looking for g of zero, and then the uh, integral from zero to three of g prime is simply the what? Area, right? Uh, displacement, right? So uh, positive and negative values we got to keep track of. Okay. So we got a rectangle, a triangle, and the triangle. Remember, we're looking at the region between the graph and the x-axis here. Three plus one point five minus point five, which is three plus one, which is four.
Okay, number six. Everybody okay? All right, do it number six. Uh, the graph of f is given. Uppercase f of x equals the integral from zero to x f of t. This kind of feels a little bit more abstract. What if I just find the derivative of both sides? We can kind of see a more clear relationship here. So f prime must be equal to the derivative of this mess. And what's the derivative of this expression? f of x, yeah, just f of p of x times p prime, right? So plug the x in. I know I'm not going to move from f because I have two operations canceling each other out. So simply f of x. So this is graph of f, which in, in terms of uppercase f is, f is uh, the derivative, right? So that shows the relationship that this is lowercase f, but everything that they're asking about is in terms of uppercase f, which means that this is my f prime graph. So if I'm dealing with my f prime graph, I'm going to gather information like we did with curve sketching. And then we can look at our slope and concavity sign lines and see which of these statements is true. So let's go back to our derivative graph knowledge here. We know that x-intercepts will be slope zeros. Above is positive slope, below is negative slope. My critical points are 0, 2, 4, and 5. 5 because that's the end point. We start off above the x-axis, so positive slope. Then below the x-axis, which is negative slope. Above the x-axis, positive slope. The arrows are helpful, kind of gives us an idea of how the actual graph is moving. Second derivative sign line, we know that the peaks and valleys of our f prime will show up as points of inflection of the original graph. So that's going to be 1 and 3. Positive slope on the F prime is going to translate to what information about concavity? Concave up. Negative slope. This, this is where my slope is becoming more negative, is moving in the negative direction. On the original graph, it's going to end up shaping like concave down. So I think uh, reading the sign lines, we should be able to answer our question here. Uh, is F decreasing from 1 to 2? That's definitely false. Is there a relative minimum at x equals 2? No. No, that's false as well. f of x is decreasing from 2 to 4. Oops. Yes, this is true. But let's just go ahead and check the other ones. f has a relative max at x equals 1. There's a point of inflection, but there's no relative max. That's out. Point of inflection at 4. There's a relative min, but points of inflection are 1 and 3, so that's not quite right either. Okay, page eight. Number seven should just be applications of second theorem. Try that. And we can skip eight. We haven't quite learned yet the integral rule for one over x. So we can do seven.
both my upper and lower bounds are variables. I'm doing a derivative of an integral, so that's how I'm going to do second theorem. Upper bound f of p of x times p prime, and then minus f of q of x times q prime. Upper bounds process gets evaluated first, then subtracted by, then uh, lower bounds process. All the meanwhile, we don't have to change tangent because we know that we're taking the integral, but then we're coming right back. Okay, bottom of the page here. So the bottom here, it's going to have a have a kind of a free response question feel. This is like what a, a free response question could look like on AP exam. So uh, we're getting a taste of it here. So we'll skip eight. Let's go to the, the bottom half. The graph of F is given. So here's the graph of F. Uh, it's not very clear here, but uh, the graph should be extended out like this. Consists of two line segments, one, two, and then a semicircle. G of x equals the integral of one of one to x of f of t dt. This looks, com looks complicated, but really this is just a way of saying this is my g prime graph. Okay. So a lot of times, rather than saying that, they will give it in, in this form and seeing if uh, students can make that connection. We can make that connection. Just find the derivative of both sides, and we should that relationship should clearly show up here. So g can become g prime. And then the derivative of an integral, which is come back down to f of x. So this f graph is our g prime. And typically, that's how AP exam is going to give you for response questions. They're, if they give you a graph, nine times out of 10, it's going to be a derivative graph. But part A is simply asking the, for the area under the F, right? Because so G of 0, G of 1, G of 5 is not um, involving the, well, it's involving um, the area under the F graph, right? So if I want to find G of 0, well, first, let me just go ahead and find the areas that's involved here, right? So we want to make sure that we are looking in the correct place for for um, displacement only between the graph and the x-axis. You may see other shapes elsewhere, but that's not part of our problem. So if I, if I fill this out here, got a square, I got a triangle, they're all below the x-axis, and then I have a semicircle all right, that's above the x-axis. All right, g of zero. I'm just going to follow my definition here. So I prefer to read from left to right, um, so that so I don't have to do flipping the signs backwards here. What can I do? Yeah. I have a question. Mark. Yeah. Oh, am I doing this wrong here? One half. I my radius is one, right? Oh, and I, yeah, I see. Yeah, I skipped the step. So one half pi, pi r squared. My radius is one, so one half times pi. One yeah, half. Okay. Uh, what can I do so that it makes it easier for me to read the graph? Yeah, flip it. Let's read from left to right. I can pull a negative out in front. So from 0 to 1, 
my integral is negative two, but there's a negative already in front of it. So negative times negative two is just positive two. Let's do g of one. G of X and F of X. Why does F, why does F of T fit in G of X? Uh, so typically this is what happens whenever uh, a bound has a variable. They use a, a different variable, so it doesn't, there's, it doesn't conflict. But ultimately, uh, this is going to turn into F of X. But yeah, we can think of this as F of T or F of X. But this is notation where if there is an upper bound variable, the expression will usually use T. Uh, what's nice about this process here? If my bounds are both the same, zero. it's just going to be zero, right? So that's nice. Okay. G of five. So now I'm going to add up all these numbers here from, oh, sorry, from one to five, not all of them, just from negative one to five. So negative two minus one plus pi over two. All right, let's uh, let's finish uh, the rest after a break. I will um, give you a uh, an adjusted um, homework sets. So I will uh, send you uh, what I want to check uh, the Thursday after we get back. So it won't be as long as this. I'll just uh, uh, highlight the most important problems for you to, to do, uh, and I'll send out over over reminds. All right, all right, come get your phones. Okay, thanks. I'm still trying to figure out No, for each of the characters, I'm going to I'm going to say, 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 for you. Or this
I still don't believe it. It's just like, yeah. Well, you know, I think it's a big Yeah, I think it's a big thing. 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 I think it's Oh, well, and let me know. Or actually, you know where I see it. You know where I see it. You know where I see it. I 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 know where I see it. Thank you. We middle We will do this during the neighbor call. What's it going to be? Oh, Japanese tea ceremony. Oh, dude, I didn't read. I literally. I was going to the next one. I was going to the next one. It did say find the dimension. I didn't read. Find obviously has minimal. I'm actually illiterate. That's crazy weird. <laughs> but you know what? I don't know. If I saw it, let's see how much. It is not the exterior. We will be this I didn't know. Oh, I didn't know. Yeah, it's not Mr. Yang. I thought it. No, I didn't yes it. But, like, I was so with this. Like, I guess. Yeah, hold on. I don't know if I get this. But Mr. Yang looked at it. He was like, that's fine. I was like, all right, yeah. He's like, yeah, we're crazy. Yeah, we're if I grab you know what it is. Oh, yeah. Oh, we have to recompose our stats. Some, some random words in the jargon have been it should show up okay because it's like it's like negative five negative four negative three negative three, negative three. all of a sudden those still going to find all of a sudden changes to five okay thank you okay yeah, but I want you to show me that you're getting a negative number to confirm that it's because this looks like this looks like um first river passes. What about this one? Oh, this is this this is just for the capital. Yeah, but it does the same job, right? If there's a if it's concave up, then if it was concave down, then you know there's a max. Yeah, if it's concave up, then you know it's a min. Right, that's what I did. But you need to you need to demonstrate that knowledge. Oh, this is not demonstrating here. 
I need to see that. But if you want to go through secondary test, you want to show that this is the negative number, which is therefore, which is therefore probably down. Right, because this sign line is not, you know, it's not so This is not just those. I'm not going to look at the sign line and know what that means. You have to look. You have to do it. You have to. Yeah. You have to say it. I mean, because right now, this is like you know, that you're testing. That, that, that looks like I, can, that, I don't know that it's like that you meant to do that. Where's that? You're good. This guy starts up and we look to the other way. Right, it's a good argument. He's a really bad man. Young. Don't take him away. You better. I'm I'm not sure which group you can file. Oh, yeah, this is just for Chris. Oh, okay. So, how Oh, Oh, 